What if that night didn't happen? What if things were different? Can I do anything about it? Should I change the outcome? All these thoughts running through one man's mind in the year 2023 over something that happened 15 years earlier. Something that had nothing to do with the two main protagonists that year. Something that, to this day, remains one of the darkest moments in Formula 1 history. By the time September 2008 had come about, the battle for the Formula 1 World Championship was heating up. Between the young sensation of Lewis Hamilton at McLaren and Felipe Massa at Ferrari, we were four rounds away from the end of the season, and already things were getting tense. In Belgium, Hamilton was denied a win through to some, I guess you could say, stern views of the rulebook. But whatever one's viewpoint on that whole ordeal, whether right or wrong, Massa inherited the win that day them's history. And now Hamilton and Massa were virtually neck and neck in the standings, heading into round 15 in Singapore. There's a buzz in the air and a sense of excitement. This will be the first Formula 1 race ever held in Singapore, and the first Formula 1 race ever to be held under lights. The prospect of racing at night time raised a few questions. How will the temperature and the humidity affect the race? Will the track lights blind the drivers? Could Kazuki Nakajima resist the urge to have his usual accident? A few unknowns heading into the weekend, and with the championship on the line, and made it all the more palpable, just under 3.2 miles in length and boasting 23 corners. It did have some interesting track characteristics that no one had ever really seen before, such as a section of track passing underneath the grandstand, which on the surface of things did look a little bit perilous. Any concerns, however, would be allayed. The racetrack was as safe as safe can be, although not quite as safe as a subscription to Surfshark VPN. Yeah, I had to do that, didn't I? As you may have already ascertained, Surfshark is a VPN service that encrypts all the data that you send through the internet, protecting your data, therefore keeping any wackaloons from getting at it. But this ain't good to Steiner. This ain't a one-trick pony. Based on whatever country you happen to be in, content from streaming services can be restricted. With Surfshark, however, you can bypass that by changing your location. Not only is this good for people who want to keep up with their favourite shows, but it can be a vital tool too for those who live in countries that heavily censor their people for whatever their reasons may be. It ain't quite teleportation, but it is about as close as we're going to get right now. So, here's an incentive. By using my link in the description and using the promo code JoshRevel, you can get Surfshark VPN for 83% off and three extra months for free, which means for around about a couple of bucks a month, you have the protection of Sir Lancelot's race seat, plus those three free months and a 30-day money-back guarantee as well. So what the bloody hell are you waiting for? I would also like to thank Surfshark for their continued support of the channel. Without them, many a project would not be possible. So take it from me and give them a try. Okay, let's get back to it. The first practice session was led by Hamilton, setting the benchmark for the weekend. Although in the next two practice sessions, it would be the Renault of Fernando Alonso who would take the top honours. This wasn't too much of a concern to Hamilton, nor Massa, considering Alonso was not in contention for the championship. Which was strange because Alonso is a driver who should always be in contention for the championship. And he was with Renault that year, who did help guide him to two world championships in 2005 and 2006. After Alonso left for McLaren in 2006, Seven, however, Renault started to drown. Their lineup of Heike Kovalainen and Giancarlo Fisichella was not taking the pride of France to the promised land. Renault were getting toward the stage where they were thinking, uh, do we want to be in Formula 1 anymore? So, knowing that Alonso's tenure at McLaren was about as much fun as being thrown off a cliff, Renault took him back in for 2008, driving alongside new boy, Nelson Piquet Jr. Piquet may have shared his name with his father, but that's about where it ended. In some ways, that's a good thing, but Nelson Nelson Piquet Sr. is an all-time great of the sport for a reason. His ability behind the wheel was beyond question. Whatever you may have thought of him off the track when he was on it, the ability was undeniable. Living up to his name on track is almost an impossibility, and for Junior, that was kind of proving to be the case. Alonso was leaving him for dead most of the time, although he would get a podium at the Hockenheim ring midway through the season, which surely would have instilled some confidence in him from the Renault hierarchy, right? In qualifying, Massa took pole position by a hell of margin over Lewis and Ferrari teammate Kimi Raikkonen. Behind them was Robert Kubica in the BMW Sauber, Kovalainen in the other McLaren, Nick Heidfeld in the other BMW Sauber, and Sebastian Vettel, who noisily put his Toro Rosso into 7th place, proving to everyone in the paddock that he MIGHT just have a future. Just maybe. Where was Alonso in all of this? 
Well, he was down in 15th, his car having failed him midway through qualifying. Had that not happened, he was looking good for a start on at least the third row and maybe even the second one. Boy was paddling that car that weekend, but at least he got to share the pain with his teammate who was down in 16th place. Though the only problem that particular car had was the person who was driving it. Renault therefore had both cars starting the race from the back of the grid on a circuit that didn't look promising for passing and in a car that wasn't a million bucks either. But it didn't matter. The team apparently hatched a brilliant plan that would give them the best possible opportunity to score points and maybe even go one better. Race day. Uh, night. The first F1 race held under lights and a close championship battle. This was exciting. Although for Nelson Piquet Jr. it was a little too exciting. Seen here doing donuts on the formation lap of all things. But hey, for all we know, this could have just been his unique method of warming his tyres up. Whatever works for him I guess. Out go the lights and away they go. 61 laps to determine the winner. And immediately Massa was staking his claim. He began to gradually eke out a margin over Hamilton. This was a day or night that Massa would prove to everyone that he was a worthy championship contender, or as James Allen so eloquently put it. But it's certainly a day for Felipe Massa to convince any remaining skeptics that he deserves a, teat, a seat. Running away to almost certain victory, provided everything goes to plan, whatever that plan may be. Whatever Renault's plan was, however, was confusing everybody because on lap 12, they pitted Alonso. Now, they did put in a sum total of three tablespoons of fuel into the car to start that race. And thus, with refueling still allowed back then, would mean that a lighter car with the super soft tires at the start of the race would allow for him to pass more cars more quickly. Or at least, that's how it would work on paper. But as Mercedes learned in the last two years, paper can be a lying the strategy was, in the words of Martin Brundle, rather bizarre, which is a violently British way of saying they've gone batch. Alonso did make up three spots in the opening lap, a pretty good start. But after that, he wound up stuck behind Kazuki Nakajima, who thus far was avoiding the temptation to have his usual accident and driving to the standard that we know Kazuki is capable of, as was Yano Trilli up ahead. Although that just meant that he was holding everyone up in one long, painful ribbon of hell known to you and I as the Trulli train. Everyone in that damn train was lapping five seconds a lap slower than Massa. Alonso right now was cursing that paper that the strategy was on. This is not working. And now here he was in the pits, very freaking early. This strategy better pay off, but how could it ever? The damage was done. Alonso was going to need one hell of a miracle to pull himself out of this mud. And then just moments later, Sebastian Borde went off. He rejoined the race, no harm done. One lap went by. Two laps did not go by before... What a kawinky dink. Nelson Piquet's tire warming methods on the warm up lap paid dividends with him slamming his gearbox into the wall on lap 14. Two laps after Alonso had made his unique pit stop because of where his car was, this brought out the safety car and now all hell broke loose because this closed the pit lane, leaving most out there stranded and their strategies in tatters. If you were desperate for fuel or a piss like Nico Rosberg was and you had to come into the pit lane, it would mean a 10 second drive through penalty. Aside from Alonso, the two Red Bulls of Mark Webber and David Coulthard did make a pit stop before the safety car came out, as did the Honda of Rubens Barrichello. Although perhaps sensing the fishiness of the whole situation, Barrichello's engine made a weird metallic sound, which was the engine's way of saying to Rubens, Walk home, punk. Finally, the pit lane was open. There would be pain though, especially for Massa, and this pain would be known as Ferrari. The Ferrari mechanics released him too early. The green light clearing Massa before refueling was done, dragging the fuel hose down the pit lane with him. This wasn't the most aerodynamic of additions to the car, nor was it very legal. This also killed his race, as by the time the mechanics ran down, took it off the car and released him back into the field, he had dropped right down to the very back. He'd be dropped even further back when the stewards decided that dragging a fuel hose down the pit lane and being released into the path of Adrian Sutil was unsafe. I mean, pfft. PC malarkey and health and safety is just getting out of control. It wasn't the first time either that Ferrari's semi-automatic light system caught them out in the pit 
stops. Their faith in Italian electronics was not paying off. Rosberg was out in front, but he would be getting a penalty for pitting under the safety car. Ditto two for Kubica. That meant that Alonso, who was now in fifth, would be right in the hunt. But there was still Trulli and Fisicala ahead of him. It didn't matter a hell of a lot because all those ahead of Alonso had to make another pit stop. When all was said and done, when the checkered flag was waved, Fernando Alonso won the inaugural Singapore Grand Prix. A tremendous effort from P15 to finish first. Almost too good to be true. It's an irony, isn't it, that uh, without that fuel line falling off in qualifying and being back in 15th on the grid, forcing them to do an unusual strategy that worked perfectly when the safety car came out because the other Renault hit the wall, it's, uh, it's played into his hands. Either Martin knew exactly what was going on here, or Blood has seen way too many movies. There were actually more than a few that thought all of this was a bit fishy. But I mean, come on. No team would ever deliberately crash one of their cars, just so the other one might have a sniff at victory. I mean, that's just too much of a stretch, right? Massa, meanwhile, drowned after his penalty, whilst Hamilton finished in third. Useful points, of many, that he used to propel himself to his first World Drivers' Championship. An absolutely goddamn deserved first World Drivers' his championship. For Massa, it was a bitter pill to swallow, but as of now, there was nothing to argue. Midway through his contract, Nelson Piquet was dropped by Renault. It was a tumultuous end to the relationship with both parties at each other's throats. Team boss Flavio Briatore criticizing Piquet for not getting enough points. Piquet retorted by claiming that Flav had eaten said points. He was replaced by Romain Grosjean for the rest of the season which went well, and the world moved on without PK for a few days. Him having come to the conclusion that if they're gonna ditch me like that, I'm gonna take all of them down. He went to the FIA and reported that for the Singapore Grand Prix the previous year, he was ordered to crash on purpose by Renault. Okay, okay, this is not good. But for now, all of this can be kept under wraps. The public doesn't need to know about this, provided investigative journalists don't know. Ah, sh on August 30th, news broke of the intentional wrecking and now everyone involved was quaking like a pug on angel dust. Just a few days later, the FIA laid the smackdown on Renault, directly accusing them of manufacturing a deliberate crash during the 2008 Singapore Grand Prix. A few days after that, PK made his second of two statements to the FIA, whilst at the same time, his first statement was leaked by the press. This did not appear to be a fake, and Renault got pretty damn cranky and began legal action against the PKs, commencing criminal proceedings proceedings, claiming these allegations were false, and all of this was an attempt of blackmail so that Nelson could keep his seat for the remainder of 2009. Whatever their attitude was, however, the fact was that Briatori and Pat Simmons were being roped together in a very serious allegation of race fixing here. This was the 1937 Tripoli Grand Prix all over again. Huh? Simmons was offered immunity if he became a rat, and he would lay down a bombshell by claiming the crash was all PK's idea. Then the radio transcripts came out that showed a great deal of vagueness in Pat Simmons' dialogue and Flav dishing out language used in his heyday, dealing counterfeit Armani jackets in the Mediterranean. On the 16th of September, Renault reveals they would not contest the allegations and that Simmons and Briatori would be gone, effective immediately from the team. This spoke volumes, effectively implicating that both these dudes were directly responsible for all of this, almost an admission of guilt, Call it what you want. Briatori claims he had nothing to do with any of it and that he merely resigned to save the team. Which, by the way, were getting raked over the coals, as you would imagine. The World Motorsports Council meeting still took place and Renault were handed the punishment. A disqualification for the Renault team, suspended two years. So, in a roundabout way, they were on probation. They could continue on, as per usual, in the Formula One World Championship. But if they screw up one more time before 2011, Later, boy. Simmons was banned for five years, whilst Briatori was given an indefinite ban. Briatori was also banned from managing any F1 drivers for the foreseeable future. His insistence on his innocence killed him in this instance. Poetry. Alonso was cleared of any wrongdoing, with there being no evidence that, despite benefiting from a very suspect strategy and being the driver in the very center of it all, he actually had anything to do with it. There was also someone who went by the name of Witness X, a Renault employee who, disgusted with what happened, relayed everything to the FIA. After back and forth legal gaga, Briatori's indefinite ban was lifted. Both he and Simmons were eventually allowed back into the paddock come 2013. The PKs won a libel lawsuit against Renault in December 2010, and the two main sponsors of Renault ended their agreements with Renault before the year was up. Renault themselves, who were already contemplating quitting Formula 1, almost certainly had had enough at this point, even though on that day, they did get the win. 
and they would keep that win. And everyone who got points that day kept their points. Massa knew that it may have cost him the title, but seeing as how it was a year after the fact, Massa just accepted it for what it was until years later when the old man opened his mouth. Bernie Eccleston revealed that they had known about the race fixing scandal before the 2008 season had ended, but decided not to do anything about it so as to avoid a major scandal, saying that effectively, once Lewis set his hands on the trophy at the awards gala, it was set in stone. Massa heard these comments and thought, wait, hold on, what the actual hell? And then those questions posed earlier came flooding back all at once. What if that night hadn't happened? What if things were different? Can I do anything about it? Should I change the outcome? As of the making of this video, he's looking to do just that. Personally, I hope nothing comes of it, but the anger felt is certainly understandable. One man's dream potentially destroyed by another man's desperation. We feel bad for Massa. We feel conflicted with Lewis. We feel indifferent with Nando. But the fact that we're still talking about this race, that it affected history, that it could still affect history, says it all. This incident that we call Crashgate truly did change Formula One forever.